why do these kind of attacks happen in people who have got no history of them previously? Well, sudden cardiac death in young athletes is a rare event. It, it affects 1 in 50,000 people. It's usually due to hereditary problems that affect heart muscle or the electrical system of the heart. And the sort of things that are usually implicated or the conditions that are implicated include hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a heart muscle problem due to an abnormally thickened heart, or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is another heart muscle abnormality due to an abnormal right ventricle, or electrical faults of the heart, such as the long QT syndrome and the Brugada syndrome. Now, the vast majority of people with these conditions are usually well and don't suffer from much in the way of symptoms. A small number may have warning symptoms, such as dizziness or fainting episodes when they're exercising, but a very large number die suddenly during exercise, and I suspect that's because exercise is associated with massive surges in adrenaline that actually push the heart to its limit. And if someone's already got an abnormal heart, there's a very high chance that those surges in adrenaline may cause the heart to go into a very d dangerous rhythm called ventricular fibrillation, which effectively culminates in sudden death. Now, oh, that puts it into perspective a, li a little bit. Uh, when you say one in 50,000, when issues like one that happened with Fabrice Mwamba come into the media eye, and the attention is brought onto these kind of issues. It puts in the spotlight for a sustained period of time. However, has this kind of thing been happening in the past? And it's, it, it's only in issues like this or on large spectacles like football games in London where it gets brought to the media. Have these things been happening for, for decades, for centuries? Well, sudden cardiac death isn't something that's novel. I mean, if we look at the history of the marathon, then the first Greek marathon runner that ever completed the marathon apparently died of a heart attack afterwards. So heart attacks or sudden deaths in athletes is nothing novel. I do find that reporting of these events has increased significantly since awareness was raised in the 80s and 90s. I did mention that sudden death in athletes occurs one in 50,000, but if we look at conditions that can actually predispose to sudden death, by that I mean if we screened thousands of athletes, then we find a potentially sinister disorder in one in 300 athletes. So there's one in 300 athletes in the United Kingdom that harbor a condition that could potentially kill them. So if we were going to be talking about screening or testing for conditions, I don't think we should use the incidence of sudden death, which is relatively rare, one in 50,000. We should be using the prevalence of the conditions that may cause these events, which is one in 300. And when you mentioned that this happens for athletes, when you look at the normal guy who goes out and dresses up as a, as a bunny rabbit and runs a half marathon for his local charity, do you think there needs to be more screening and more protection for, let's say, amateur athletes and, and those who do it for in a non-professional sense? Well, sudden death in athletes is not confined to the most elite athletes. Uh, when it affects the most elite athletes, it's very visible, as in the case of Fabrice Mwamba, uh, and it, it's, it's uh, highlighted grossly by the media that basically uh, talk about the circumstantial paradox and the number of life years lost. But it's not just the elite athletes. Indeed, the paradox is that uh, these conditions are much more common in recreational athletes and those involved in grassroots sports. So I don't think that we should just be talking about elite athletes. We should be talking about all individuals that participate in competitive sport, including young school children who uh, perform cross-country running and so what have you. I should also mention at this point that if we're looking at sudden death as a whole in young people, not just athletes, then we see about 600 such deaths in the United Kingdom every year. That's 12 every week. So it's not something that is quite as rare as was once thought. And you, you just touched on children there. What are the groups in society that are most at risk? The most vulnerable cohort of uh, athletes or young people that die suddenly during sport are those in um, adolescence and early adulthood. If we look at reports from the United States, for example, the mean age of sudden death during competitive sport is 17, and, and if we look at Italy, it's about 23. So most deaths occur during that age gap. If we look at data on sudden death, then 40% of sudden deaths occur in athletes aged 18 years or younger. 
mentioned Italy there. There's um, quite a significant amount of testing goes on in Italy. Do you think there needs to be a lot more testing done here? The sudden death of young athletes clearly uh, raises the issues of testing. We know what causes these deaths, we know how to diagnose it, and there are management guidelines for many of the conditions implicated. Most Western countries do not have mandatory screening programs, but Italy is an exception. There's been a screening program in Italy ever since the early 80s, which involves a health questionnaire, physical examination, and a 12 lead ECG, which is an electrical tracing of the heart. These tests uh, uh, have been conducted in competitive athletes on an annual basis, and when they look at longitudinal follow-up, they have noticed that over a 25-year period, their death rates in sportsmen have reduced from 3.6 per 100,000 down to 0 0.4 per 100,000, and that represents a 90% reduction in sudden death, and the vast number of these reductions have been due to the cardiomyopathies, the heart muscle disorders that are most commonly implicated in sudden death. So I think there is there is certainly something very uh, important to be said about screening programs. In the United Kingdom there are screening programs but they're confined to the most elite athletes such as the Football Association, the Rugby Union, the Lawn Tennis Association and now the English Institute of Sport. There is very little for athletes who are not quite competing at that very high level. Um, if there are such fantastic opportunities for those at the top, how was it that Moamba managed to slip through the cracks, if, if you may use the term, and something like, like this did happen if he was getting the very best this country can offer. There is obviously um, a concern about screening in that it is not 100% foolproof, and this is no different to breast cancer screening or cervical cancer screening. No screening test will identify everyone. The current screening protocols amongst elite sportsmen include health questionnaire, ECG and an echocardiogram, which is a cardiac ultrasound of the heart. In my personal opinion, that will pick up nearly 80% of all those that could potentially die, but there are a small number of conditions, such as premature coronary artery disease, this is abnormal furring up of the coronary arteries, anomalous coronary arteries, where the persons born with the coronary arteries are rising from slightly the wrong places, and acquired conditions, such as inflammation of the heart muscle due to viral illnesses, these conditions will not be identified with screening. So we've got to accept that our screening is not foolproof. But having said that, the more investigations we perform to identify some of these rarer conditions that may cause sudden death, then there is the issue of cost becoming prohibitive. So we've got to balance the issue of cost um, and, of course, the yield. Um, we met a gentleman called Sean Rogers from just outside Doncaster, and the man had died for 15 minutes, and he also died for 37 seconds. When these kind of things happen, when his heart has stopped for that length of time, what are the effects on his body that he may or may not be fully aware of, but that what are the general effects for when these kind of things happen, the after, after effects? Well, the important thing about the heart stopping is that the heart is a major part of the circulatory system. The heart pumps blood around the body, it pumps five litres of blood around the body just to maintain the organs. So if the heart goes into a dangerous rhythm where it's not pumping efficiently or there is no mechanical function, then we worry of course that there is no oxygen going to important organs such as the brain and the kidneys and there is always this risk of an individual who's had a cardiac arrest for a protracted time suffering brain damage or even going into kidney failure or damaging other very important parts of the body. So the things that we worry about after a long cardiac arrest is really cognitive function, whether memory will be affected, whether other parts of the brain will be involved, whether the patient will be the same again, have the same memory, or have the same personality, or even, even function at all. So anoxic brain damage is the term that we use, is what we worry about most. And of course then there is kidney failure, but the, imp the good thing about the kidney failure, or the optimistic thing, is that you can support the kidneys whilst they start to recover. The brain is a major issue. I think the important thing, of course, if something does happen like this, is to rapidly cool the patient, to stop any inflammation around the brain, to minimise the risk of major problems occurring afterwards. Now, in, your, in your own pres professional experience, you've dealt a lot with the London Marathon. What do athletes who may or may not be highly trained and highly experienced, what do they need to do to prepare themselves properly 
and safely for an event of this size. I can't stress the importance of adequate training and preparation for a grueling event such as the marathon. Uh, 27 miles of running should not be taken lightly and should really not be practiced by anyone who cannot run at least 16 miles comfortably without stopping. That's point number one. Point number two, it should not be contemplated by anybody that's getting warning symptoms such as chest pains when they run breathlessness that's disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed, dizziness when they run, or blackouts, or in those who've got a family history of premature cardiac disease because many of the conditions implicated in sudden death run in families. And finally, it should, be, should not be contemplated in older individuals who have multiple risk factors for coronary artery disease such as high blood pressure, smoking, and raised cholesterol. If, if anyone falls within these three categories, then they must seek a medical opinion before they even consider running something like the marathon. Finally, uh, the other important thing to younger individuals, the un message for younger individuals is not to run a marathon within a week of a flu-like illness or a chest infection because you won't get very far. The risks of heat stroke in people who've had viral illnesses are much, much higher than the general population. So that's the other group that should probably defer marathon running for another year. Moving on from the marathon a little bit, um, Britain's got a, a humongous summer of sport ahead of it. Um, bringing the Olympics to London was absolutely fantastic and it will be fantastic. You've also got the European Championships and you have all these people taking part in marathons. With the Olympics coming and the emphasis put on sport this summer in 2012 in the UK, you're going to see a lot of young people being inspired to follow in the dreams of their athletes. If young people are looking to follow in these footsteps, excuse the pun, um, what would they need to do themselves and what should their parents be looking at to do before they start trying to take on something this serious this soon? That's a good question. I think the Olympics is going to leave a legacy uh, a timely legacy in, a, in an environment where we're seeing uh, an epidemic of obesity in young individuals. People are becoming more and more sedentary, uh, exercising less in general, uh, becoming more, more dependent on media networks to, to, to communicate or even to play games. They play visual, virtual games as opposed to real games. So I think the, uh, you know, the marathon, uh, I'm sorry, the Olympics will encourage exercise. We know that exercise is very good for the cardiovascular system and has benefits on the cardiovascular system. In fact, people who exercise regularly live about seven years longer than those people who don't exercise at all. So I can, I'm delighted that the Olympics will promote uh, this type of positive lifestyle activity. But one must also reflect on the uh, converse uh, situation in that you have got young individuals who will be pushing themselves very, very hard. We know that one in 300 of those have potentially got a serious cardiac condition from our previous experience. So my advice would be that any young child or young person that's experiencing any of the ominous symptoms I talked about, notably chest pain on exertion, breathlessness that's disproportionate to the amount of exercise being performed, palpitation, dizziness, or blackouts, or even those with a family history of premature cardiovascular disease and sudden cardiac death, that group must be tested by a doctor before they continue. I, in the ideal world, of course, I would recommend that everybody between the ages of 14 and 35 be tested uh, more comprehensively, not, just with just, not with just a history and examination, but also a, an additional 12 DCG to identify silent faults because 80% of people that die, die without any warning symptoms whatsoever. I'm drawing to the close here. You've touched on a number of issues that have been very, very important and very, very topical. There's just one thing that I'd like to ask you uh, especially, and that is the one question that I did not ask. So if there's anything I did not ask that you think should be mentioned, what would that be? I think the important thing is who is going to perform all of these investigations. Uh, we are pro-exercise. We understand that exercise... Uh, is good for you, but we also know that a small number of people with serious cardiac conditions succumb during sport. We realize that screening programs can save lives, but the issue is who's going to be performing the screening tests. And I believe that these screening tests should be performed by experts who are well versed with the 
changes that occur in the athlete's heart in terms of the ECG changes and echocardiographic changes and are able to differentiate between those changes from athletic training from those representing cardiac pathology such as things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because there is this risk of false positive tests when we do ECG so it's important that these investigations are performed in centers used to dealing with athletes to minimize this worrisome concern about false positive tests in athletes otherwise there's a risk of false disqual disqualification and unnecessary tests which don't make screening as palatable as I'd like it to be. My job is, is a job to be envious of. I, I enjoy it very much and wouldn't do anything else. That makes total sense because you do, you do make a difference and you can change lives. When you speak of experiences, what has been probably your best ever experience in the medical field, the most rewarding? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Very difficult question indeed. I've had numerous uh, fantastic experiences. Uh, I think for me, really, it, it, it brings home to the point that I am actually a medical doctor first than any other type of sports doctor. And I think some of, some of my, my favourite moments or my best moments, the moments that have left me elated, is, is actually saving a life, where I've actually been involved with a cardiac arrest that we thought was going to go terribly wrong, where the, where the outcome was absolutely brilliant and the patient walked out uh, where we thought we were expecting the worst and those have been some of my best but of course on the negative side uh, we have had to, I've had to deal with uh, young parents who have lost a child aged 17 or 18 but, but to be able to test the other children and provide the good news that this potential hereditary condition that the young kid died of no one else in the family has it it gives me great joy to provide that sort of positive uh, news for parents, but also if we do so find something, to reassure them that we are there for them and we will make sure that such a catastrophe does not strike the family again. That makes a huge difference, the power of that sort of reassurance for a family unit who, who have travelled hundreds of miles depending on you, but to be able to deliver it has, has been one of the best feelings. There are times, of course, that life isn't so easy and that I do feel, I wouldn't say incompetent, but, but maybe less, less impotent able. or less <laughs> able, where I, can't, where I haven't been able to do what, I, what the family wanted me to. Um, and, and that just goes with the territory. You can't always achieve what you set out to, but I, you know, the important thing is to do your level best whenever you can.